Texas Republican Congressman Jeb Hensarling. Congressman, good to have you on the program. Welcome. Good morning. Thanks for having me. So can you assess, I want to talk about this hearing that, that gets underway in about an hour, but can you assess what your expectation or uh, sort of assessment is of the legislation so far? Well, Maria, too often in Washington, legislation is only judged by its advertised benefits. What we really need to do is judge it by its actual benefits and its actual cost. So here we are four years into Dodd-Frank. The advertised benefits were that it would lift the economy, uh, that it would spur entrepreneurship, uh, that it would end too big to fail, and it would make the system uh, more stable. So four years later, what do we know? As far as lifting the economy, we continue to be in the slowest, weakest recovery. I think it's official now in the, in the, in the history of our country, with tens of millions still unemployed, uh, one in seven, I believe, dependent on food stamps. Uh, as far as spurring entrepreneurship, small business or business startups are at a 20-year low. Uh, as far as ending too big to fail, uh, <laughs> frankly, after four years after Dodd-Frank, what, what do we see? The big banks are bigger. Uh, the small banks are fewer. Uh, I would also opine that the taxpayer is poorer. Uh, and I believe that Dodd-Frank codified actually too big to fail. Now, financial stability, uh, it's not a term that's defined uh, by statute. Are we more financially stable or not? I guess it's an open question, but financial stability also comes at a cost, and that is low and middle income Americans are seeing their credit card cost rise, uh, free checking is going away, uh, many of the uh, banks are now being forced into unbanked sources uh, of credit. Uh, again, I think there is a direct causal link uh, between Dodd-Frank's almost 2,000 pages of law, thousands of pages of regulations, 400 rules, half of which still haven't been finalized. So I do not believe that Dodd-Frank has lived up to its purported benefits. I think it's a huge drag on the economy. I'm thinking it's, gonna, it's hurting low, moderate income Americans. Uh, and all of this is going to come out at our hearing today. Yeah, and, and I guess so what it sounds like is what has been implemented has not been, has not uh, brought us the promise uh, of, of a better system. And yet, what? Are we talking 40 percent, 50 percent of Dodd-Frank hasn't even been implemented yet? Why the delay? Well, uh, that's right. Roughly half the 400 rules uh, that were mandated by Dodd-Frank still haven't even been uh, implemented by the regulators, which is another way of saying, Marie, in many respects, Dodd-Frank itself was not a traditional law. What it was was a license to the unelected, unaccountable bureaucrats to go out and work their will on the economy uh, as they wish. And even the rules that have been formalized, like the Volcker rule, is incomprehensible comprehensible to the mind of man. I mean, no one has been able to draw this distinction uh, between market making and proprietary trading. That's just one example. The qualified mortgage rule, when it is fully implemented, uh, CoreLogic has said roughly 40 percent of the mortgages uh, originations of today wouldn't even qualify. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a mess. It's a mess. Yeah, I, I'm glad you brought up market making versus proprietary trading because this whole idea of the vocal rule and, and, and uh, you know, this idea that pr trading for the, yourself uh, it shouldn't be allowed because it's too risky. L let me ask you about that because it feels like that has triggered a whole host of sales of prop desks on Wall Street. It has also created a, a feeling of being frozen. Uh, some of these banks don't really know what the law ultimately will say, and so they're sitting on cash and not investing. Oh, it, it, incredible. There, as you well know, there's trillions of dollars now that are sitting uh, on the sidelines. Uh, so to some extent, again, Dodd-Frank in general created two different types of regulations, uh, those that create uncertainty and those that create certain economic harm. Uh, Volcker probably comes in. Uh, you can categorize that as both. And, and so what's going to happen when it's incomprehensible? Uh, what happens is uh, the banks won't do it. That, that business will be um, offshore. And by the way, nobody, nobody has made the case that proprietary trading had anything to do with the financial crisis. And in fact, the firms that tended to div uh, have a diverse revenue stream were better able to weather the storm. I mean, at the end of the day, what caused the financial crisis more than anything else was the erosion of traditional prudent 
underwriting standards, garden variety mortgages, uh, unfortunately subprime mortgages, much of it incented, cajoled, and mandated by the federal government. Right. Uh, and so, you know, it wasn't even uh, a proprietary trading in the first place. Yeah, no, I think you make a lot of good points. And let's face it, Fannie and Freddie had a lot to do with it, and you were the only person in Congress to actually come up with uh, comprehensive reform for Fannie and Freddie that was noticeably absent from Dodd-Frank as well. Where do we stand there? Well, uh, again, Dodd-Frank's greatest sin of omission was it didn't do anything about the root cause of the problem, and that is the affordable, the misguided affordable housing goals on steroids of the Fannie and Freddie uh, monopoly. Right. Uh, I would, and so uh, we have passed this legislation uh, out of the House Financial Services Committee. Uh, about a year later, the Senate finally got around, or I should say Senate banking got around uh, to doing something, but uh, regrettably, I am seriously uh, doubtful that there's enough time left in this Congress uh, to be able to move this forward. Uh, I hope the president will join us early in the new Congress and try to forge uh, a path forward. Um, I guess like most issues in Washington, I'll approach it with high hopes and low expectations. And, and then, of course, there's the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which has come under attack from all sides, not just for the ineffectiveness of it, but for a terrible culture there. Let me ask you, Congressman, are you looking to repeal Dodd Frank. Is that where we're going here? Well, the truth is, I guess I only believe that 89.7 percent of Dodd Frank was bad. Uh, and I recall something, I think it was Yogi Berra once said, kid, you've got third base so screwed up, nobody can play it. Dodd Frank has the whole economy so screwed up, it's going to take us a while uh, to solve all these uh, problems. So I would say this, Maria, that uh, we've passed a whole host of bills, uh, regulatory relief bills in our committee, particularly aimed at saving disappearing community banks. Right. By the time this Congress is over, we would have dealt with, again, Dodd Frank's greatest sin of omission, Fannie and Freddie, and their greatest sin of commission, that is codifying too big to fail. Uh, and so we will functionally have repeal the worst elements of Dodd-Frank, but it's going to take years to unpeel uh, and solve all the problems uh, that this uh, onerous law has created uh, on our uh, economy. Well, businesses everywhere are hoping that you also attack uh, tax reform. Uh, this is an issue that obviously uh, is getting worse, given the fact that an increasing number of American companies are exactly. choosing to take their company and move out of America. Let me ask you about that, because the last uh, we heard from Jack Lew, the Treasury Secretary, is that he would rather do some kind of a penalty or punishment for companies that actually are looking to improve their cost structure by, uh, by getting in a better tax environment and out of America than actually uh, looking at the problem. And that is tax policy. Are you going to get to tax reform soon? Well, uh, that's not within my committee's jurisdiction. Uh, that's down the hallway at the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, I believe we ought to have fundamental tax reform. I support it. I don't want to move the process forward, but that decision is above my pay grade. But I do think, you know, it's fascinating that for 200 years, companies have wanted to come from overseas to America, and now under President Obama's policies, for the first time, you're seeing companies uh, that want to leave America and, and vote with with their feet. There's no doubt about it. We have the highest single corporate tax rate of the industrialized uh, world. So I'm not an expert on, on tax policy, um, uh, but I got to tell you, our problems would be substantially solved with a flatter, simpler, fairer uh, income tax. Uh, and that's what I support, and I hope we move forward on it. And, and then there's this massive, uh, you know, massive uh, sort of handcuffs on the banks today uh, with regard to the amount of money they have to put aside for the regulatory environment and for legislation. I mean, the numbers are mind boggling, whether it be, you know, what some firms are paying for sanctions, uh, doing business with bad actors around the world, or, or the mortgage problems. Uh, do we have any visibility in terms of are we at the tail end of this, or is this the new normal in terms of multi billion dollar fines for the banks? Well, Marie, it's a good question. I don't know the answer to the question. Um, again, with respect to all this capital, I think a very good case can be made that clearly, in retrospect, uh, capital standards, leverage standards uh, were inadequate. 
but that doesn't mean they need to be made more complex. Dodd-Frank, Basel III makes these things incredibly complex. And in addition, regrettably, uh, it kind of makes risk assessment more uniform and top down. And by doing that, you almost relieve investors of their obligation to do due diligence. I mean, remember the regulators told us you don't need to reserve capital for all right. intents and purposes against sovereign debt and mortgage-backed securities. Think Greek bonds, Fannie and Freddie. Now, when you spread that top down throughout the entire system, the whole system implodes. What you need is different people looking at different risk structures. There's no substitute for people having their own capital in appearance and in reality in risk. That is the best arbiter of risk within our economy. Congressman, good to have you on the program. We'll be watching the hearings today and what comes out of it. Thank you very much for having Thanks me. Thanks so much. House Financial Services Committee Chairman Jeb Henserling joining us.